millenarianism is belief in an imminent major transformation to the temporal world, often spiritual in origin and often involving a reversal of the prevailing hierarchy of power, so that the currently oppressed will come to be masters over their oppressors. Such anticipated transformations are generally apocalyptic in nature, involving major destruction, upheaval or cataclysm before the establishment of a prolonged or eternal utopian system. The word millenarian is derived from the Latin millenarius, which means relating to or containing a thousand. It is not to be confused with millennialism, which is also derived from Latin, but from mille annus, meaning a thousand years, the Christian belief in the millennium. But actually, millennialism is an example of millenarianism. There are many other examples of millenarianism from around the world and throughout history, and there are plenty available today. These groups hold that society's current authorities are corrupt, evil or deficient in some other way, such as failing to recognise the importance of worship or worshipping the wrong things, often material. And these deficient authorities will soon be destroyed by forces too powerful for mankind to control. Further, they consider that the deficiencies of the current system cannot be overcome in any other way. A common feature is that the current unsatisfactory and oppressive regime is likely to get worse before the cataclysmic end and introduction of the utopian age, and specifically get worse for the proponents of the millenarian movement. This can be seen in modern perceptions of the immorality of the capitalist economic system, the proliferation of vast conspiracy theories and the more extreme global warming doomsayers, with groups who see themselves as either bringing about or at least surviving the coming cataclysm, after which they will be rewarded for their beliefs and actions. Millenarian movements characteristically form under conditions of social stress, and particularly in the presence of oppressive foreign rulers. They may develop around charismatic figures who may have visions or dreams of the future and a message to return to traditional morality. There are numerous recognisable examples of this kind of thing, including various Christian sects like the Christian Israelites, the Seventh-day Adventists and Branch Davidians within that church, as well as Hasidic Judaism and sects like Heaven's Gate, Rastafarianism and Mormonism among others. There is, of course, debate about the usefulness of the millenarian category and what should and shouldn't be included, but one thing is clear. Early Christianity was a good example of millenarianism, and this is a well-argued position in scholarship that is within the mainstream. Classifying Christianity as millenarian, however, does not really help much with the historicity versus mythicism debate. Which brings us to cargo cults. Cargo cults are examples of millenarianism. They are a phenomenon of Melanesia that arose in response to contact between the natives and more technologically advanced societies. They began towards the end of the 19th century and reached a peak during and just after the Second World War. Cargo cults get their name from the belief among their followers that westernised vehicles such as ships and planes and the advanced and manufactured products they contain were from their gods and rituals like building runways, mock aeroplanes and control towers would result in real aeroplanes landing and giving their cargo to the believers. Cargo cults were characterised by a synthesis between indigenous and foreign elements, the involvement of ancestors, charismatic leaders and the belief in the appearance of abundance of goods. Wealth was an important mark of personal value to traditional Melanesians, and when they were exposed to colonialism, foreigners appeared to be far more wealthy than they were, and they felt devalued. As they had no knowledge of modern manufacturing methods, they developed beliefs that manufactured goods were produced spiritually by their gods or ancestors, and that these goods were intended for them but were being subverted by foreigners. It's this particular aspect of cargo cults that seems to have led to the belief in this form of millenarianism in the delivery of goods and riches. And cargo cults also showed syncretism between traditional Melanesian religions and Christianity, with, for example, cruciform grave monuments. Cargo cults were primarily a consequence of the large military deployments in the Pacific by the opposing sides in the Second World War. The term cargo cult first appeared as a derogatory description used by Westerners in the Australian Papua. 
It first appeared in print in 1945 and was later adopted by anthropologists who classified other movements that had occurred over the preceding decades for the same basic reason of contact between primitive and technologically sophisticated populations. The first recorded example is the Tuka movement that began in 1885 in Fiji. This foresaw a revival of religious practices and a reversal of power so that whites would serve blacks. It was started by traditional Fijian priest Ndugomoy as a counter to the influence of Christian missionaries. The Vailala Madness was another early example that occurred in the Papuan Gulf, which is in what is now Papua New Guinea but was then in the Australian territory of Papua. The movement began in 1919 and declined after 1922. Adherents believed that a ghost steamer would shortly arrive, piloted by their returning dead and bringing a cargo of various Western artefacts. They further believed that their returning ancestors would be white, an idea that was to appear recurrently in later cults. But it was the cargo cult activity during and after the Second World War that made the phenomenon a noticeable subgroup of millenarianism. This occurred on the Melanesian islands where the inhabitants witnessed the largest and most technologically advanced war yet fought. First, the Empire of Japan invaded in 1942. In turn, the Japanese were driven back by the Allies, principally the Australians and Americans. Both sides airlifted large amounts of hardware to the islands. These events had profound effects on the lives of the islanders, many of whom had never seen outsiders before. Canned food, medicines, tents, weapons, vehicles and clothing appeared in large quantities for the soldiers who shared them with the islanders whose cooperation they were keen to secure. When this ceased at the end of the war, charismatic islanders arose promising the reappearance of cargo delivered by parachutes, planes or ships. Such deliveries would be gifts from their ancestors and were encouraged by the islanders by imitating what military personnel had previously done in preparation for their deliveries. Mock-up runways were built with control towers manned by islanders wearing wooden headphones. Parade ground drills with mock-up rifles were conducted. Full-scale replicas of aeroplanes were built. Similarly, aspects of Western society were also often imitated, such as taking morning tea and listening to mock radios made of local materials. This has given the term cargo cult the spin-off meaning of scientific or technological ideas that seem superficially credible but don't work. Most cargo cults have died out since the Second World War, but there are survivors. Noteworthy are the John Frum, Tom Navy and Prince Philip cults of Tana Island. The Prince Philip cult worships Prince Philip, husband of Queen Elizabeth II of Britain. It is likely that Tom Navy was a real person, possibly Thomas Beatty, an American from Mississippi who was a missionary in the Melanesian Islands and joined the US Navy Construction Battalion during the war when he acted as a recruiting officer. Tom Navy is now viewed as a character revered for promoting peace and sustenance. John Frum, as far as we can tell, is either entirely mythical or his true origins can no longer be discerned. His following started in the late 1930s, before Melanesia's involvement in the war, and grew into a cargo cult later. Unlike Tom Navy, John Frum is worshipped as an actual messiah who will return with cargoes and bring lasting power and prosperity. John Frum in particular is advanced by mythicists as a modern day instance of the process that led to Christianity. As far as we can tell, there was never any real John Frum. The name probably derives from Americans introducing themselves as John from America. And the idea that John Frum is black may derive from an African-American member of the US military, but unlike Tom Navy, there's no historical person we can identify who appears to have been behind the character. Nevertheless, John Frum was given a historical backstory as a real person who had come to the islands and preached his message, and who would return bringing lasting power and prosperity to his followers. There were also the usual religious trappings of visions and prophecies and evidence of syncretism between the traditional Melanesian religions, Christianity and Frumism. And furthermore, this took place over a period of 15 to 20 years, a process and time frame entirely consistent with the mythicist version of the founding of Christianity. This process of casting a mythical character as a real historical figure is called euhemerization, after the ancient Greek euhemerus who went in for it. 
There is no doubt that the cargo cults, and John Frum in particular, do establish the possibility of historicisation of mythical characters over short periods of time. There are many commonalities between millenarian movements and the founding of Christianity, and that Christianity was a millenarian movement is a well-justified and commonly held position within mainstream scholarship. However, millenarianism per se has little to say about the debate between historicity and mythicism. The cargo cult examples of millenarianism do have this feature because they provide a modern case study in euhemerization of a messianic figure. But that is where the commonality between specifically cargo cults and Christianity ends. There are several other common features between cargo cults and Christianity, but these are commonalities shared with other millenarian religions. The ideas of social stress, oppression and a desire for inversion of hierarchies etc. can all be seen in the cargo movement, but no more so than in other millenarian movements and the key events in the cargo cults were completely lacking from first century Judea. Those being the exposure of highly isolated peoples of largely Stone Age development without written languages to not so much foreign oppression but to modern technology. The way it's often argued amounts to saying that among millenarian religions, cargo cults in particular arose in a similar social setting to first century Judea. Further, cargo cults were associated with euhemerization of messianic or saviour figures, and this makes it likely that early Christianity was associated with euhemerization of Jesus. But this argument is quite false. Millenarian religions in general did arise in social settings with similarities to first century Judea, but cargo cults in particular were a special case dominated by the issue of first contact between primitive and advanced populations. Within millenarian religions, cargo cults were particularly weak parallels of Christianity for this reason. The real reason many mythicists focus on cargo cults is not because they had particularly similar social settings to first century Christianity, but because they had this feature of euhemerization, and therefore to argue from them that Christianity had euhemerization too is circular. That aside, cargo cults are a fascinating case study into how religions can develop, and they do show us that the mythicist idea of Jesus arising as a spiritual figure who was given an entirely fictional earthly history is quite possible, even if the probabilities may be overestimated. Therefore, I consider that cargo cults do favour mythicism, but the argument from them is a weak one.